Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Edgy Edge Functions at Superbase. My name is Greg Richardson. I'm a guest speaker here today to talk to you about OpenAI and how we can actually integrate OpenAI with Superbase Edge Functions. Let's get right into it. So as always, when you're creating a local Superbase project, we're going to need to run Superbase init. Of course, you'll need the Superbase CLI pre-installed to run this. And this will create a subfolder within our project called Superbase with all the configuration for our local project. From there, to create a new function, we can run Superbase functions new, followed by the name of the function. Let's call this one OpenAI. And you can see here now a new functions folder has been created for OpenAI, and it contains an index.ts file. Now, just in case this is your first time using edge functions, edge functions do use Dino as the runtime. So assuming you're also using VS Code like me, let's configure VS Code to understand this file as a Dino function. To do that, you will need just one extension called Dino from the official Dino land organization. Go ahead and install that. Once you've done that, you can come back here, open up your command palette and just type in Dino initialize workspace. For us today, we'll turn linting on and unstable APIs off. You can see that that created a new VS code folder with its own settings file that enabled Dino. Now that we've done that, you can see at the bottom here, uh, VS code does recognize this file as a Dino file and we're no longer getting any of those uh, errors. So as you'd expect, the first thing we need to do in order to integrate with OpenAI is to import their module. With Dino, all modules are URL based, but we can hook into the NPM registry by using a special service called esm.sh. These guys are a CDN where they actually wrap the NPM registry. And anytime you go to call a package, it will actually fetch that for you from NPM. So as you can see from the OpenAI documentation, they do have a NPM package called OpenAI. Now, OpenAI has a whole bunch of different APIs available. They have APIs for embeddings, images, completions, and some other things. Today, we're going to look at completions because completions are one of the most interesting things right now. This will allow us to essentially build our own app that can integrate with GPT-3's completion model, similar to what ChatGPT does for us. If we take a look over here, we can change our language to Node.js, and you can see the code required for that. Of course, since we're using Dino today, our import is going to be a slightly different syntax. Let's do that right now. So we'll start by saying import OpenAI from, remember, we're going to pull from ESM. So we'll do esm.sh slash, and this is where we'll put in the package name, OpenAI. Now, by default, if you don't give it a version, it will always try to point to the latest. But best practice would be to actually to lock this to an, a version so that we don't get any unexpected behavior later on. You can see down here in the code hint that it's actually pulling in 3.1.0 as the latest. So we can just copy that over, pull that over. Now, you might get a warning here that says that this is not cached on your computer. Uh, let me just demonstrate that by going to an older version. So it says uncached missing remote URL. To solve this, you can actually just hit controller command dot on your keyboard with that selected and then click on cache. And that will basically cache that locally on your machine so that your VS Code development experience is better. You'll get access to the types and therefore code hints and IntelliSense and all that great stuff. All right, now that we've imported OpenAI, let's go ahead and make use of their completion functions. Coming back here, we can see that they have some sample code that we can reference. Uh, first thing we'll notice is at the top here, we're actually not importing OpenAI directly. We're, we're pulling out configuration and the OpenAI API. Let's actually just copy that, come back in here, and we'll, we'll replace OpenAI with that. Next, we set up our initial configuration for OpenAI along with some code that actually instantiates OpenAI itself. Let's copy those two lines over and we can just paste them right here at the top. Now with Dino, when you need to access a environment variable, it's gonna be a little bit different than Node.js. Your environment variables aren't available under process.env. There is no process as you can see here. Instead, as you can see here from the Dino documentation, you grab environment variables through the dino.env.get function. So let's go ahead and use that. Now, why are we using environment variables, by the way? Well, we're going to need an OpenAI API key in order to interact with OpenAI. You can get that key by signing into OpenAI on their website, heading on over to your account settings, and in their API section, creating a new API key. Of course, we don't want to be hard coding our keys right in our code, so that's why we store them in an environment variable. Let's go ahead and do that right now. We'll create a new file called .env.local. This will be a .env file we'll use to store environment variables just for local development. Later, when you go to deploy this edge function, you would want to create a an edge function secret that would store this environment variable remotely along with the edge function. So let's create that environment variable now, and this is where you would paste your key. Finally, we can go ahead and call the completion function to generate a completion based on some prompt that we'll give it. Let's go look at OpenAI's example. 
So we can just start by copying this example over. Create completion is asynchronous, so that's why we're going to await in front of it. We're going to use the latest model today, which is text DaVinci 3. Here's the prompt. For now, we'll just leave this hard-coded string that says, say this is a test. We'll expect the prompt to reply with something like, this is a test. In the future, we'll make this dynamic with a query given to us from our user. We can set the maximum amount of tokens we want uh, from the reply from GPT-3. And then finally here, we can set the temperature, which is talking about how deterministic the reply is. So since this is a large language model, we have the opportunity to actually vary the response given the same prompt multiple times. Here, temperature of zero means it's gonna be fully deterministic and therefore the same prompt will always produce the same answer. Now, instead of stringifying this data from before, we're gonna instead pull out the response result. To do that, we can destructure it from the response. Since we're using TypeScript, we have the benefit of types here to learn what the response looks like. If you want, you can actually hold Command or Control or sometimes Alt on Windows to drill into this function. Scroll on over here and let's take a look at the create completion response. And you can see that it's gonna return a bunch of things. One of those things being the choices, which is gonna be an array of responses. And then from here, each choice will provide the actual text for the answer, along with some other things. Now the Axios response itself will also have a dot data property, I believe. Yes, which will contain everything that we just talked about. So if we wanted to destructure this, we could say const data equals response. And then to destructure data, we can alias that and then continue to destructure. So we have our choices and we can just keep going here. So choices, we could pull up the first element of the array and we care about the text property specifically here. Now you might be wondering why is choices an array? In what situation would it, would it ever return multiple choices? Well, if you actually look into the type on prompt, this create completion request prompt, and we drill into that, you can see that it actually accepts a array of strings if you wanted to. In our case, we just gave it one string, but you could give it actually multiple prompts, in which case it will give you multiple replies. So finally, we'll take our text and we'll return it as JSON here. And what I like to do as well is OpenAI will return an ID for this response. And this ID will be unique for every response. And it's good practice to send this along back to our client as well to give them a unique identifier to tie to this response. If you're using React, for example, this is a great candidate to be used for keys if you were to be mapping over an array of completions. We no longer need this data object, so let's go ahead and remove that. And this request.json is just talking about the actual request body sent to this. We're not gonna use that quite yet. We'll come back to this in a second. Okay, to test out what we have so far, we're just gonna save our file. We can come down here to the bottom and they have a nice curl function we can copy to our clipboard to test this out. Um, we're gonna open up the terminal at the bottom. And before we can actually test this out, we will need to start our local Superbase stack. To do that, we can just run Superbase start. This uses Docker under the hood, so you will need Docker installed on your computer in order for this to run. Okay, now that that's started, we need to go ahead and serve our edge function locally to test it out. To do that, we can run superbase function serve followed by the name of the function. So this one we called OpenAI. Now do note that at this point in time, edge functions are actually run inside of a container. Hence why you see this as the, the file path for it. Just keep that in mind as you're developing. All right, let's go ahead and open a new terminal tab here. And we can test out this edge function by running that curl command from earlier. And when we run that, we actually get a 500 internal server error. What's going on? Well, if we head back to our first tab, we can see we're actually getting this XML HTTP request is not defined. So what's actually happening here is OpenAI uses Axios, the Axios library under the hood. And Axios actually makes use of this XML HTTP request, which is the traditional way that browsers would make uh, fetch requests. This API is not part of Dino by default, so we actually will just need to polyfill that in order for this to work. If we go to Dino's website, we can actually find a package here called XHR, which will act as a polyfill for Dino. We can come down here and copy this import command. Uh, do note that the latest version is 0.3.0, so we'll just update this to be that latest version. We can come back to our code and just paste that at the top here, and we'll change that 0.1 to 0.3. Just like before, we'll hit command or control dot and hash that locally so that our VS Code has that library available to it. We'll restart our local function and try it again. Okay, so we got another 500 error. What's going on? Let's take a look back here. And we're getting a 401 error code. Note though that this 401 is actually coming from the Axios library, which we just found out is being called from OpenAI's 
library. This means the 401 is actually the response coming back from OpenAI's API. And 401 means unauthenticated, which would lead us to believe that our API key doesn't seem to be working for some reason. And it turns out that's exactly what's happening. When we put our API key into the .m.local file, problem is, is that by default, this local edge function doesn't know to look at this .m.local file in order to load that environment variable. We have to explicitly pass it in as a CLI parameter. Let's do that right now. So the serve function, we can pass in a dash dash m dash file. And from here, we can pass in that .m.local file. Okay, and we'll try it again. And there we go. Finally, we got a response. This is indeed a test uh, along with a completion ID. So coming back to our prompt, say this is a test. This is what we would expect from this prompt. Okay, the last thing we might want to do here is make this prompt dynamic so that the end user could pass in whatever query they want, and that will be fed into OpenAI's prompt. So typically, the way you'd retrieve that query from the user is through the request body of a post request. So let's do that right now. Instead of name like we had before, let's change that to query. And the assumption here is that the request body would be in JSON format. Let's take that query and pass that directly into our prompt. Now, in reality, if you're making a custom application using OpenAI, most likely you're not going to just one to one pass this query directly into the prompt. You'll probably have your own prompt that's specific to your application, and then you would inject their query within that prompt. If you're interested to learn more about this technique and all the details around uh, designing the prompt and essentially a whole end-to-end -end application where you can basically inject in your own custom knowledge base into this prompt, feel free to check out a video called Clippy GPT over at my channel called Rabbit Hole Syndrome. In this video, I talk about how I built Clippy GPT for Superbase and basically hold nothing back. We go fully down that rabbit hole. So to finish this off here, let's increase our max tokens from seven to something higher, maybe 256 for now. We'll leave our temperature at zero, and that should really be all we need to prove this. Let's open our terminal back up here. And this time in our curl request, we'll change the data we send from name functions, which was the default one, to query. And at this point, we can make our query whatever we want. Let's make it, what is soup base? Of course, we forgot to restart our function. Let's do that quick. And of course, let's save our file too at the same time. And we'll give it another try. Here we go. Superbase is an open source Firebase alternative. And then proceeds to tell us the rest that it knows about Superbase. This is awesome. Now, one thing you may notice if you try this yourself is that the response will take a little while. And this is actually no accident. Basically, the time it takes for the response to resolve is one to one with the length of the response. So the longer this text answer is, the longer it will take to give you that result. So you may find that the user experience behind that isn't great. Uh, you end up loading for a long period of time. Um, the way ChatGPT solves this is you might have noticed they actually stream the response in real time. As each word becomes available, it actually will pop in on the screen. And that's not just some flash animation. They're intentionally doing that so that you can get your results quicker. This technique is called streaming. And if you're interested to learn more about that technique, stay tuned. And in our next Edgy Edge Function video, we'll be actually be covering streams. So that's it for today. Next steps with this project would be to obviously follow some production best practices like check the response for errors before sending it back to the client. But I hope what we did today gets you up and running. Thanks so much for joining me today, and I hope to catch you in the next video.